Hello everyone, this is Lady Bridget, and welcome to Reaching for the Moon, episode 48, for Samhain 2018. Sirona, tell everyone about this podcast and how they can get in touch with us. Hello and welcome to Reaching for the Moon, presented by Everglades Moon Local Council, Florida Chapter of Covenant of the Goddess. COG supports individual works by its covens, members, and local councils. It's a vibrant network of a myriad of Wiccan and witchy resources, religious support, friendships, service opportunities, and more. To find out more, visit our website, emlc.net, our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash evergladesmoon, or Twitter, at emlctweets. So, what's going to happen in episode 48? I'll bet you're wondering. We're going to start out with a reading by Coyote Morningstar of a poem called The Witch's Ballad, written by Doreen Valiente. After that, Reina is going to conclude her Beloved Dead series as we turn the wheel once again to Samhain, where we started it, and she will wind up the Beloved Dead at Samhain. Alpandia has written a fairy blessing, and she's going to read that and share it with us also. Alpandia has also started a new series on Tradition Talk. This time around, she has interviewed Kanu of Beachfire Coven, who also happens to be the first officer of Covenant of the Goddess this year. She interviews Kanu about his tradition, and we learn quite a bit about Georgian. Coyote Morningstar will then bring us some more poetry, and of course we will have music, and I'll introduce that at the time that it happens, and we have a winner for last month's contest. So stay tuned, witches. Blessed be and happy Samhain. The Witch's Ballad by Doreen Valiente Oh, I have been beyond the town where nightshade black and mandrake grow. And I have heard and I have seen what righteous folk would fear to know. For I have heard at still midnight upon the hilltop far forlorn with note that echoed through the dark the winding of the heathen horn. And I have seen the fire glow and glinting from the magic sword and with inner eye beheld the horned one, the Sabbath Lord. We drank the wine and broke the bread and ate it in the old one's name. We linked our hands to make the ring and laughed and leaped the Sabbath game. Oh, little do the townsfolk know when dull they lie within their bed. Beyond the streets, beneath the stars, a merry round of witches tread. And round and round the circle spun, until the gate swung wide ajar, that bar the boundaries of earth from fairy realms that shine afar. Oh, I have been, and I have seen, in magic worlds of other when, for all this world may blame or praise, for bane or blessing, not I care. For I have been beyond the town, where meadows sweet and roses grow, And there such music did I hear as worldly righteous never know. Those who have died have never, never lived, but did have a pact with the living. Is the ancestor's word in the voice of the water? Hello everyone, this is Reina again, and here we are, almost at Samhain. It's time for another episode of The Beloved Dead. This will complete a year of podcasts about ancestral work, and I really hope that you've enjoyed this experience as much as I have. I am working on a book project related to ancestral practices, and so this has really helped me organize my thoughts around the Wheel of the Year Um, and come up with, uh, sort of put down on paper, many of the different practices that I've had. So I hope that we will stay in touch. And as you develop your ancestral practices more, you will let me know uh, how things are going. You can always reach me at RainaTempleby at gmail.com. So for Samhain, the witchiest time of the year, I have a few more things I want to tell you about. Um, 
I first want to remind you to clean your altar. Always a good idea every Sabbath to clean your altar, refresh the water. If you have a glass of water, uh, clean the cloth or change the cloth. And now, of course, is the best time to add new ancestral photos to that altar as well. I hope you'll make some food offerings this Samhain, maybe cooking something that was a favorite of one of your ancestors or something that relates to your heritage. That's something we've talked about in earlier episodes, and if you want to know more about it, you might want to go back and listen to some of those. But food is one of our um, most potent connections with spirit and um, keeps alive the knowledge and practices of our ancestors. So it's always a good time. It's never a bad time, really, to make a food offering. I wanted to talk about a new um, altar practice that we haven't really discussed before, and that is creating or finding your tool for spirit communication. Up to now, we've been talking about asking for messages um, pretty much just while doing altar work, meaning while you're preparing your altar, while you're meditating in it, in front of it after it's prepared, maybe while you are handling a coin or some other tool, but we haven't really um, talked about dedicating a specific magical tool to this. One of the most um, well-known tools in the sort of popular media is the Ouija board. And even though it's usually seems very silly when it shows up in movies, it is an actual real tool for spirit communication. And I know some spirit mediums who prefer the Ouija board over all other tools. So um, you're probably familiar with how it works. Basically, you can create your own. Um, basically, you just have to have some sort of object that you are holding that's movable uh, across a board of letters. Ouija boards have the advantage of it being very precise. Um, Obviously, if you're spelling something out, that's really, really clear and specific. They usually require a couple of people. It's recommended that you have a couple of people be present so that somebody else can be writing down while the person who's actually doing the spirit mediumship is moving their hands across the board. I like to suggest also a pendulum. Um... Lots of us have pendulums already, and if you're going to use one for spirit communication with your ancestors, I suggest that you dedicate it to that purpose. So it's not the one that you pull out when you're just trying to decide whether you should go out on Saturday night. Pendulums are not as precise, obviously, as a Ouija board, but they do um, have the advantage of being simple, straightforward. They're not expensive. We almost always have some in our homes already if we're pagans and witches. And they can give you a simple yes or no. And as you work with the pendulum, you can create a more sophisticated understanding of what the movements mean. So I know people who have pendulums where um, the direction of the spinning means something and um, reverse and forward and they can go back and forth and across and diagonally. And there's actually a lot of different things that happen with pendulums. So if you work with it over time, And especially if it resonates with one of your particular ancestors, it might become the perfect tool for you. And if you want to get really witchy, since it's Samhain, another tool for spirit communication is the crystal ball. And this is especially good for people who are visual as opposed to auditory. So if you're going to be likely to get messages from your ancestors in the form of visions, um, spectral images, cloudy movements, or even actual faces, then you might want to be thinking about getting a crystal ball because this is the perfect tool. If you get one made of natural crystal in particular that has inclusions, you're going to look into it and depending on the light and your um, state of mind, you're going to be able to see stuff in there and and messages will come through. So if you're a stone person, you gravitate towards working with stones. If you already have a crystal ball you're not using, if you just want to look badass like a witch um, from who knows what kind of movie and you want a crystal ball, give it a try. Um, A glass crystal ball will also work. I know people who use those. I myself have found that to be harder. 
Um, there's nothing in there to kind of get you started with the vision. Whereas if you're using natural crystal, the inclusions help you uh, get your mind started on what's going to happen. Okay, there's lots of other tools as well. Um, I encourage you to think about this and find something that really works for you. The point of having a tool like this is that it works like your cell phone. It's basically a way for you to initiate contact with your ancestors. Um, and this has the advantage of being, of kind of some, creating some boundaries and some control around communication with spirits. So if you are particularly naturally sensitive, or if you've just been doing this work and you're starting to get sensitive now, or if you are at a time in your life for, for one reason or another where you're sensitive, and you have reached out to your ancestors, they may start coming a lot. They may be knocking at the door all the time, waking you up in the night time, distracting you when you're trying to work. And so it's good to have boundaries set up where you are the one who gets to decide how much time you spend talking with the dead. Remember the dead have a very different sense of time than we do. And so you might say they have sort of endless amounts of free time. And it can become really a very, very big job to keep up with a number of ancestors. So it's really a good idea to have something that allows you to be the one to ring them up. And that's one of the main reasons that you want this kind of tool. Thinking about boundaries, you might want to go back and listen to the podcast, the Beloved Dead podcast, where I discuss the risks of getting pregnant and how to avoid that. If you're working with your ancestors, this is just another aspect of, of setting limits on your interactions with them. It sounds strange to say that because we've just spent a year talking about how to establish contact with your ancestors. But believe me, um, certain ancestors in particular, maybe the ones who have unresolved issues with you, or maybe the ones who are just very invested in your spiritual growth can become a very sort of an ever present voice in your head if you are open to it. Okay, so a tool like a Ouija board, like a pendulum, will help you control when and how much contact you have. You also, with these tools, are able to control who you contact. So you make the time, you get the tool out, you, you get quiet, you settle yourself down, you go in front of your ancestor altar and light a candle, and you reach out to a particular ancestor through the tool. Again, this is useful because, as we've said, there are more ancestors that are more reasonable and helpful to work with than others. Um, these tools also help you as reminders to maintain communication. So if you keep the tool in a, in a semi-visible spot, you know, obviously magical tools are often kept wrapped in silk or something else like that. But um, if you keep it with your other magical gear or on your altar, it'll help remind you to dial them up on a regular basis. One last piece of advice on this is it's always a good idea to use a brand new tool for this kind of work. Um, unless it's something that you've inherited from your actual ancestor who was a closeted witch in the day, back in the day. Um, cool antique Ouija boards are out there on eBay and they just may already be very much enmeshed in other people's energy, other spirits' energy, uh, stuff that you don't necessarily need to have to hassle with. So I recommend a new tool. All right, well, I wish you good luck with using your new spirit communication tool and I hope to hear how it goes for you. The last thing I wanted to offer today in the podcast are some reading recommendations. I haven't really suggested very many of these along the way because there are very few books on ancestral worship that are relevant for modern witches and pagans. However, I wanted to give you a couple of ideas of things to read if you're like me, you like to have things to read to develop your spiritual path, practice. <coughs> Excuse me. The very first book that really spoke to me about ancestral practice was John Belia by Louisa Tisch. This is a very famous book. Um, Tisch is a well-respected elder 
in our community. She's originally from New Orleans, so she comes out of a Afro-diasporic tradition, and it's just a beautiful book, very creative, full of practical spell work to do, um, and it has some some nice easy techniques for working with your ancestral spirits as well as just she's a person who grew up with an ancestral practice so it's cool to learn from somebody like that jambalaya by louisa tish the next book i want to recommend is the fairy teachings by orion foxwood which is the book in which he explains the river of blood and this really deep in my ancestral practice. I had been working with my ancestors for 15 years, 20 years before I read this book, but it put so many pieces together for me about why it's really necessary to do this work. He also made it very clear and explains uh, in depth in the book how we are redeeming our family lines and ancestral lines when we pray for our ancestors. So as we've discussed in some of the podcasts, we benefit our own lives today and the lives of our descendants by praying for the enlightenment of our ancestors. And so this work can become profound and benefits all of humanity as well as the earth. And I think Orion does the best job of anybody I know explaining how that works. The next book I want to recommend is The Witch's Book of the Dead by Christian Day, which is not what I wanted when I picked it up, but does have a lot of interesting techniques in it. And it's certainly worth reading Uh, If you're somebody dedicated to ancestral practice, it's a lot about necromancy, a lot about controlling the dead, and that's not really uh, my path so much, but mixed in there is also just um, the experience of somebody who works with the ancestors a lot. And again, given how few books there are available on the subject, I think that's one that you should look at. Now, the last book is, and by far the most useful book for my ancestral practice of anything I've ever read, is called Talk to Me, When the Dead Speak to the Living, and it's by Jamal D. Fiosa. I'm going to spell that name because it's a little unusual. Jamal is J-I-M-A-H-L. The last name is D-I-F-I-O-S-A. Talk to Me. When the Dead Speak to the Living. This is a short little book written by a spirit medium, but it is fantastic in the sense of providing you specific techniques for getting out of your own way to allow spirits to communicate with you. Jamal's philosophy is that we all have this ability. Some people come to it more easily than others, but really it's about centering and tuning in. Not a lot of mumbo-jumbo or uh, fancy ritual required, just uh, dedication and time. And I think that book has really opened me up in ways that nothing else ever has. So, dear listeners, when my book is ready, I will make sure you all hear about it, but that's going to be a little ways off. I do thank you for your contributions to helping make that happen. And again, stay in touch and keep listening to the EMLC podcast. Thanks and blessed be. Those who have died have never, never died. The dead have a pact with the living. Is the ancestor's word in the voice of the water? As witches, Many of us honor the agricultural cycles of the earth, the solstices and the equinoxes. As a seer, I also honor these times, as well as the trooping fae who spin the wheel of the year and cause these seasons. Traditionally, these spirits are remembered on the Monday following the solstice or the equinox with prayers, blessings, and offerings. These give them the energy to continue moving the great wheel. Plus, it's just good manners to say thank you. Any offering is welcome. 
though they appreciate more something that you've changed somehow with your human hands. So grapes are okay, but wine is much better. They love things they can't find in nature, things that we've transformed and put our human energy into. I'd like to share this prayer for them with you that I crafted a few years ago. May the wheels continue to turn and the fae continue to troop. At this time of betwixt and between, I honor you, O brightest ones. My kin I feel, but may not always see, by whose work the seasons are spun. May strength be with you, blessed kin, as you stir earth's cauldron. You slowly marshal the seasons in, bringing summer, winter, spring, and autumn. I offer honey, liquid sun, to preserve you and lend you strength. I offer red wine, blood of the vine, a symbol of the blood we share. I offer water, inspirited by man, as exchange for the waters of your well. I offer milk, our first food, the white of the moon and of our bones. As you make the mill of the seasons turn, my kin of the green blood, blessings unto thee. Take these gifts with you as your work is done. As I do will, so mote it be. stolen Some say she gave her consent But when the king beneath the mountain sees a star against the black You really haven't any choice And there's no turning back The seventy On the chase through field and wood And some say he ran her to ground But when beauty is your weapon And you burn like the sun You draw the winter to you There's just one way this tale can run The seventy Run The seventy Choose The beauty in the grave Or the dying rose above Will you take his darkling heart Into your own to love Persephone Some say she bleeds ice And white roses Some say she flows Crimson red One season in the year To taste the flowers bloom And all the world would think That she's returning to her doom But she and her captor love a king They know that it's not true Persephone Run Persephone Choose Beauty in the grave Or the dying rose above Will you take his darkling heart Into your own to love Persephone Some say her father did bargain Some say her mother did grieve She may have lost the light But how she gained a crown To rule each dying breath To lay each body down To deliver every soul 
to the wheel that still goes round Persephone Run Persephone Choose Who you will be Are you the beauty in the grave Or the dying walls above Will you take his darkling heart And so you'll run to love I knew the beauty in the grave Or the dying rose above Will you take his darkling heart And so you'll run to love Persephone Run That song was called Persephone, and it's by Mama Gina from her album Goddess Kissed. You can learn more about Mama Gina and purchase her music at mamaginamusic.com. Hi, everyone. This is Alpandia, and I'm sitting down with Kanu, who is a member of Everglades Moon Local Council, and we're going to talk about his magical tradition. I really appreciate that you took the time today to talk to me. I know you have a lot of stuff going on, Kanu. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> Even though you were maybe forced a little bit. <laughs> Not at all. It's a good opportunity. So, Kanu, what, is, what tradition do you, do you practice? Um, I've studied and practiced a number of traditions, actually, but... The main Wiccan tradition that I've been involved with is Georgian. Georgian. So how long have you been, have you been a member of the Georgian tradition? Uh, I've been involved for about 32 years now. Wow. Then you're like a high priest in the Georgian tradition? I'm a third degree elder in the Georgian tradition now, so I could use the term high priest, yes. And you belong to a coven that sort of works with the Georgian tradition, right? Both myself and the high priestess of the coven are third-degree Georgian elders. Um, we do some Georgian practice in the coven, but we're also an eclectic coven. So uh, since the structure and management of the coven and the events that we hold are are not um, a strictly Georgian tradition, some of our practice is Georgian because we like to keep that going and make it available to our students. Um, but we also uh, have a... a experienced group of witches and uh, magical workers in our coven and so we want to make sure that across the year we give everybody a chance to contribute to the coven life so not every one of our events or, or rituals is georgian that's right and your coven is beach fire right beach fire coven yes out of miami springs florida yes so um how did you get involved with the georgian tradition um, back in college, I met some uh, friends and classes that I thought were cool and interesting people. And I actually went over to their house one evening to say hello, knocked on the door, and somebody I did not know, holding a small baby, answered the door and said hello to me. I introduced myself to him and he to I and uh, asked about whether uh, Raina and Logan were around. And he said that they were just doing a meditation for a few minutes and they'd be out quick, shortly if I wanted to wait. So I chatted with him for a few minutes and uh, about six people came out from a side room, kind of blinking their eyes and <laughs> wondering why somebody else was here. Uh, I said hello to them briefly and made my way out, but it kind of caught my attention. And so I followed up with them and uh, started to get involved with the uh, events they were doing after uh, being uh, given some reading to, <laughs> to handle a few times. Had given some reading, like what kind of books were you given? Do you remember? Uh Yes. Uh, I was given Jeffrey Russell's A History of Witchcraft. I was given um, Spiraling Dance and Drawing Down the Moon by Margot Adler uh, to read. And when I came back in a week and they asked me how it was going, I said they're, they were really good and gave them back. And they said, you finished them? And I said, yeah, I'm a you student. I read all the time. You finished those three books in one week. Yeah. That is pretty impressive. <laughs> well, it was pretty interesting. I was getting to know, you know, a whole new... Uh, potential area of belief and practice, and uh, it was interesting to me. 
So they gave me some more books and told me to go away <laughs> for a bit and read those. And after I read those, they invited me to a uh, weekend camping event uh, for Beltane. Mm-hmm. So that was the first um, real pagan event um, or Wiccan event that I ended up attending. And I've been practicing ever since. That is an awesome origin story. The fact that you read those three books in one week is just like, and I've known you for a long time, just incredible to me. So, so Georgian tradition, I'm assuming that it's named after someone? It is, George Patterson. Um, in terms of the origin story, though, there's actually one other piece of it that's, that's pretty funny because it really cracked it open for them letting me even get the reading books. Initially, I just thought, okay, maybe they did some meditation. That's cool. And I don't know. But a friend approached me on campus literally very shortly after that and said to me, I don't know if you're going because, well, you know Rena and Logan and um, uh, maybe you think you consider. And I was like, just ask, what, what is it? What is it? <laughs> and she said, well, I've been invited to a circle at their house and I wanted to know if you'd go with me because I don't know anybody else who's going except maybe the person who invited her. So the next time I went over to their house, and it was after this meditation, thing, I, I said, so, I've been invited to a circle at your house on <laughs> February 2nd. And they looked at each other very kind of shocked and amazed, whispered a few times, and I said, well, it wasn't really um, open. There weren't going to be uh, guests. So, um, well, uh, and that's when they said, here, read these books. <laughs> if you're really interested, here, read these books. Uh, and I got the point that they were a little surprised and that maybe it was not supposed to be an open event. And the person who mentioned it to me uh, also found out independently that they weren't weren't supposed to be guests at this event. And then she never came to anything ever after. (gasps) So it ended up being my introduction to the craft, though. Wow. So those are the two pieces. It all aligned just right. So so tell me more about the gentleman who started the tradition. It's named after him. That's why it's called Mm -hmm. Georgian, even though it could have been Pattersonian, I suppose. (laughs) Uh, He had some studies with... Uh, Celtic line in Boston initially, uh, but he joined the military for four years, and when he returned to the Boston area, um, his own family had apparently destroyed his Book of Shadows and his items of things. They were not happy about the fact that he had um, been studying this type of stuff, and he could no longer find the people who he was training with. Uh, so he had a, he did have some training before he went into the military, but he had kind of lost access to that line. He ended up in correspondence with though and and kind of discovered uh, other people who were practicing uh, witchcraft both uh, back in England and in the uh, United States and did some correspondence with them from what we understand Uh, and he eventually moved to Bakersfield, California where he started the Georgian Church of Wicca. Initially it was chartered through the Universal Life Church. He also filed it with the uh, state as a corporation and got wow. it going. Um, so George Patterson started the tradition with Zanoni Silverknife and a priestess named Tanith. And uh, Bobby Kennedy was one of their first students uh, who came along a little while later after they started the, the practice. Bobby Kennedy? That was her name, yes. Oh, it's Bobby a, Kennedy a was a woman. <laughs> it's a woman, yes. As opposed to Bobby Kennedy. <laughs> As opposed to the, the other Kennedy, yes. What is something about uh, the Georgian tradition that people might be surprised to, to know? Uh, the Georgian salute, <laughs> which is basically a middle finger. Um, <laughs> Georgian is a, a bit irreverent. I think one of the things that, um, that Patterson really uh, was good at is helping ensure that while people took the, the practice and the technique seriously, that there was a real joy of celebration about the tradition and in enacting the craft that he sought to reflect in the tradition. And one of the bits of irreverence uh, ends up being the the middle finger of the Georgians (laughs) salute. So everybody seems to laugh at that when they realize that Georgians will salute each other that way and (laughs) and other people as well. So given all of the irreverence and and some of that, uh, are there any common misconceptions about people who who follow your tradition? It's a little hard to say. It's a relatively small community, so I don't know that people have a lot of preconceptions about Georgians. Mm -hmm. We're often classified as derived from BTW or British traditional witchcraft, so um, I don't know that there's a lot of surprises that people get from misconceptions in the sense of I didn't 
there's many things people might not know about the Georgian tradition. Uh, I think it's one of the few traditions where some of our covens have been accepted to do to circles and seasonal celebrations or gatherings of um, gardenerians. Mm. Um, that's not necessarily true throughout the United States, but in South Florida, um, the Georgian coven from Sarasota that Marina and Logan were in would regularly come and uh, do seasonal gatherings and circle with uh, some of the gardenerian groups down here. So I think the BTW relationship was one that they kind of considered us cousins. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that people often don't know about the Georgian tradition is because it started at a time when there wasn't easy things like the internet. There was a lot of correspondence going on, and uh, Patterson had some students in the southeast, and so um, we kind of partnered with the unicorn tradition out of Atlanta, and um, Jody did some of the initiations of Georgians in the southeast after agreeing with uh, George that basically the, the traditions were similar enough and they really were pursuing the same kinds of things. He shared uh, the initiation rituals with her and um, considered those to be valid initiations uh, mm. and enactments of the Georgian tradition to help pass the line down uh, here in here in the southeast. Well, that's cool. So some of my line is kind of down line from a the unicorns, which we, in an indirect way, we, <laughs> we consider them uh, friendly and almost kind of related to us. Gotcha. <laughs> Are there any um, restrictions regarding membership into the Georgian tradition? I think you got to be alive and <laughs> you got to be interested in the craft. You make some commitments, of course, like any uh, training tradition and with degree elevations, but uh, I'm not aware of any uh, real things that I would consider restrictions on who might be able to uh, learn the Georgian tradition mm -hmm. or participate in the Georgian tradition overall. Uh, there certainly aren't any uh, ones that I'm aware of that, you know, would say that any particular person is inappropriate for training uh, just at the outset. I think all students are required to uh, keep an open mind about what they might learn mm -hmm. and what they might be able to then contribute to the craft. Both of those are things that are um, expected of uh, Georgian students uh, as they might go through de the degree system. Hmm. So, as a do the Georgians celebrate the the eight sabbats, the eight traditional sabbats, I guess, of Wicca? Yeah, the the training does include the observance of all the sabbats. There's um, specific rituals for them in the tradition. George also really encouraged people, though, to be um, creative and to not just be a by-the-book uh, tradition. He expected it to be a living tradition uh, where people would, would learn and extend what we knew as witches and what our practice was like for ourselves individually and for our covens. So, And there's also both Sabbaths and Espets mm -hmm. um, observed in the Georgian tradition. So it, it's got the, uh, a lot of the normal seasonal cycles that you might associate with the craft. Okay. Does the Georgian tradition work with a, a specific pantheon of gods and goddesses, or maybe uh, does your um, coven work with a specific set of gods and goddesses? Well, our coven works with a huge, huge. variety of, <laughs> of gods and goddesses over time. Um, we do, in our coven particularly, uh, we kind of consider Bridget and the Green Man as two of our, our most primary ones. Mm -hmm. um, so in some of the ceremonies where we um, do our own annual dedication to the coven, we use those. The Georgian tradition itself and most of the written texts utilizes Karnina and Aradia as the uh, god and goddess for, for purposes of at least having, you know, um, some classic examples, uh, but they don't discourage people from, I think, exploring um, gods and goddesses that may really speak uh, to them and that or or that they are called by as as a strega i'm very happy to hear that aradia is in there <laughs> and now we're going to have slightly different maybe these are harder questions <laughs> i always think these are harder questions in your opinion how does your tradition or maybe from your teachings how does your tradition see the the universe um, and don't answer through a telescope <laughs> I guess that's a difficult question to answer because it's so open-ended. Um, is there a way in which you think you're asking this question? 
like um, a specific lens through which the tradition sees? Well, maybe how the universe was created. Oh, I see. Well, um, we're not really tied to a particular type of creation myth. Mm -hmm. um, I think the way that we see the universe is that we are active participants in it, though, and in creating it and creating what's possible, both for ourselves and our community, and that our effect on the world is one of the fundamental things about why you would be in the craft. Um, it's not just designed to be, um, you know, we got together on a weekend and had a nice time and ate good food. Um, there really is a, a kind of the import of working on oneself physically, mentally, and spiritually, as well as um, being of service to the community. Um, so if people request help or aid, whether that's healing or other kinds of support, that we would be expected to um, strongly consider offering it, uh, and that um, teaching the craft is an important part of it. So I think we see the universe as something that we're supposed to be involved in in a fundamental way, and that as humans, we are involved in the continuing creation of it. That, that is an amazing answer. Just <laughs> so, does your tradition do magic? Yes. Like spell work magic? Yes. Um, is that something that you teach your students to do, or is that something that they have to get to a certain degree to be taught? Well, I think we teach students magic from an early stage, but what is taught is appropriate to the level of training so some of the answer may depend on what do you mean by magic in the sense of that's, that could be a big question but I think we uh, try and teach people about magical techniques kind of from the outset um, it just depends on you know the, the gravity or complexity of it changes as they go through some training and what sort of um, ethical considerations are given to the student as they're being taught through those stages well, the Georgian tradition does have uh, some of the standard craft uh, ideas about not harming others. So the ethical considerations really revolve around the, um, you know, working within the uh, idea of what your goal, you know, making sure you know what your goal is and having it be very clear, trying to make sure you understand what the object of your magic is and it's not seeking to to harm someone else. There are extreme spells that may be dangerous for other people if you need to be protected from them. Mm -hmm. um, so there's ones where, you know, we might seek justice or protection, but it's not designed to be overtly harmful. Uh, so some of the ethical considerations kind of come out in the type of training that we give in the use of magical techniques and in uh, some of the ways that rituals are basically designed and taught, you know, where uh, basically while there can be techniques that, like I, said, like I said, could be dangerous, they're not designed from the start to to be baneful spells and things like that. So. Okay. Um, does your tradition, because you, you've talked about a couple different gods and goddesses uh, during our conversation, uh, does your tradition see each god and goddess as an individual entity? Are they more archetypes, or are they... Maybe something else. My best answer, I think, is that they are considered to be their own beings, but that if somebody in our tradition said, well, I really see them as kind of part of the expression of the whole, you know, of what is sacred, what is, how sacred manifests, how deity manifests, um, that there's these different faces of it instead of their individuals. I don't think it would really be in conflict with our tradition. It doesn't seem prescriptive in the sense of having to define them mm -hmm. as either expressions of a single deific force in the universe versus their own individual selves. But I, I think we don't... I wouldn't view them from my training as just archetypes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't mean to have that sound pejorative or, or diminutive, but I don't think we treat them as archetypes. Like, as opposed to, like, I, I, I've talked to some people who feel that the gods and goddesses are very distinct individuals versus, like, uh, they're different emanations from one pulse. So, that, and from that point of view as an archetype versus, like, not kind of being 
Yeah, whatever. It's just it's just a way to look at it. Hmm. Um, I, I guess the when I heard you say archetype, I thought of it more as do we is it do we view them as uh, just a reflection of how our own psychology mm, works mm-hmm. and that we can't know anything outside of ourselves and all that kind of stuff in terms of more of the psychological right. archetype. I definitely don't see okay. them that way. Um, it's uh, more like the archetypes, like, like how like the tarot might be considered like the, the, like the arc, different major arcanas can be seen as different archetypes of, of deity and personality and yeah. manifestations that you can encounter during your life. Uh, well, there certainly are a lot of manifestations <laughs> mm-hmm. of deity that we can encounter in our lives, I think, that Georgians would consider valid. Um, so it's probably just a linguistic difference in terms mm-hmm. of how we're approaching the question and the answer, maybe, yeah. <laughs> uh, the assumptions behind it. But, for instance, I, I would not think that most Georgians would view or treat the gods as just a type of thing that's reflective of their own psychology, mm-hmm. um, even if our own psychology is deeply involved with how we see the world and interact with the world, that they are independent of us, um, but that they also thrive in a way uh, when we interact with them, when we basically have a community of people that, that recognize, call them, interact with them, honor them, that that interaction helps... Uh, reify something fundamental about about them and about us mm-hmm. both. So I don't think I've got the wisdom to say it <laughs> creates them because we do these things right. or, you know, any more than any, I would know that I'm created because they did things, right? Um, but we know that there's a strong relationship there and it's one of the things that we value. So the choice of kind of what deities you might work with and why mm-hmm. is reflective of some of the things that are fundamental about your magic or your makeup and, uh, um, you know, and what you're kind of what you're doing in the world as a, as a witch. Perfect. <laughs> I want to say that I appreciate that you sat down with me and took the time to answer all of these not so shallow questions. <laughs> um, if someone was interested in learning more about either the Georgian tradition or beach fire, is there um, a book or a website that you would refer them to? Sure. The Georgian tradition has some information on the internet at georgianwicca.com. That's the best way to find out a little bit about the tradition and to find a little bit about who's, uh, who's in it. Um, we also have a Facebook group that you can find. So you can search on Facebook for Georgian Wicca. Um, Beachfire has its own website as well, so you can look up at, uh, us up at beachfire.org. Um, one of the things that I'd quickly add that um, maybe didn't come up in discussion so far is that one of the things that's distinctive about our tradition, and I think it draws from um, George's uh, correspondence with other people early in the craft life here in the United States and in England, uh, is that there's a set of rituals in our book that are kind of what we might call planetary rituals that deal with um, the planetary intelligences and the chemia or sigils and uh, kind of number blocks for different planets. And so I think that's actually a little bit unusual in a lot of the craft community in the United States and is probably reflective of some of the correspondence um, with ceremonial magicians Mm -hmm. that he may have had. Uh, and some of the value that he put on um, astrology and um, astronomy in terms of how we're a part of not just the earth in a sense, but of of the universe. And so there's a set of rituals that specifically draw uh, on the planetary influences, which I think is something that's a little bit distinctive about our tradition. I had not known that. That is really cool. But again, thank you so much for sitting down. And I know that you are very busy, and I appreciate that you took the time to answer my questions. Well, thanks for doing these interviews on different traditions. I look forward to hearing more about some of the other folks that you've interviewed, too, by uh, listening to the podcast. Yes. Thank you, Connie. Blessed be. Blessed be. Bridget's Song by Ella Young from Celtic Wonder Tales, written in 1910.
Now comes the hour foretold, a God gift bringing a wonder sight. Is it a star newborn, a splendid upspringing out of the night? Is it a wave from the fountain of beauty, upflinging foam of delight? Is it a glorious immortal bird that is winging hither its flight? It is a wave, high-crested, melodious, triumphant, breaking in light. It is a star, rose-hearted and joyous, a splendor risen from night. It is flame from the world of the gods, and love runs before it, a quenchless delight. Let the wave break, let the star rise, let the flame leap, ours if our hearts are wise to take and keep. The Rose of Silence by Ella Young In a green stillness hidden from sun and moon under the sea, a blossom swings by the high queen's dune on a silver tree. And every poet has dreamed since time begun of that hidden place, but only those who have said farewell to the sun may come to the dune by the silver tree, or find in a hollow or height, under the still green tideless sea, the rose of silence and night. Hey everybody, before we head into the last song for this episode. I want to remind you all that Turning the Tides is coming up in December 7th, 8th, and 9th of 2018. Again, it's going to be our 12th year, so we're doing astrology as our theme. 12 houses, 12th year, makes sense. We will have an astrology track workshops, and we also have workshops on a lot of other things, whatever our presenters are feeling inspired to present. Head on over to emlc.net Click on the Tides tab at the top and you can find the registration form. You can find the form for submitting workshop ideas and you can learn more about it. Hey, who does not want to be in South Florida in December? I love the weather here then. And you will too. It's a great get together. We usually come in Friday uh, and we stay through Saturday and leave on Sunday. And this year we're able to get in earlier on Friday. So come on down, register. It's a good time. Love to see you then. And we have a winner from last month's contest for leaving a rating. If you leave a five-star rating on iTunes, I could choose you to be our winner. And this episode, we'd like to thank Rubibes, that's R-U-B-I-B-E-E-S, who left us a lovely review on iTunes. Would you please send me your snail mail address so that I can send you a prize, which is the meaning of your dreams. That's the book we were offering. And I'd like to be able to send it to you. So please email me at L-A-D-Y-B-R-I-D-G-E-T at gmail.com. That's ladybridget at gmail.com. And we will be sure to get that book out to you. And this month's prize is Tarot Spells, which is by Janina Renee. And it's so beautiful. It's got so much spell work in it for using the tarot decks. And I know quite a number of witches who swear by this book. So I think... You would love to win it. And as always, just go over to iTunes, leave us a five-star review, and your name could be picked out of the hat. Then you can email me with your name and address if you win, and I will mail you your prize. So, Rubibis, don't forget to get in touch with me. And everybody else, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. And now we are going to have a song, the last song of this episode, and it's one of my all-time favorites. It's called We Do Not Die. It's by Ginger Doss and Velvet Hammer, and it's on her Best of Pagan Song album. You can learn more about Ginger Doss and purchase her music at gingerdoss.com. It's G-I-N-G-E-R-D-O-S-S dot com. I hope you've had as much fun listening to our podcast as we've had doing it. Blessed be and happy Samhain, everyone. <laughs>
are not dead, we are alive.